So uh, when we talk about this resources, as I said, before we move further, let's understand there is a very basic term that we are talking about and that is called as a sustainability. What exactly is sustainability? Everywhere you have these talks and lectures and FDPs and all that things going on regarding sustainability. What exactly is sustainability? Are, are we able to do it? Are we really following sustainability? Or we are just spending our time talking and discussing all these conferences. So let me give you a very basic example of sustainability. What exactly do we mean by sustainability? Sustainability, sustainability is that at a local place or a defined area, if that area is able to sustain itself, whether it is in terms of natural resources, whether it is in consumption of those natural resources, whether it is in utilization of those natural resources, or creating those natural resources back also. Okay, so are, is that area able to do that? Like, let's take an example of India itself. India had those village cultures long back, like almost like 50 years back or 100 years back. Before I'll say, let's take an example before the, in fact, the British came to India. The villages were self-sustainable. The cities were self-sustainable. There was no one laying those pipelines across the cities, bringing water from one city to another. They had those, if you read those, uh, if you read those books, historical books, you'll find that each city had a water body maintained by the villagers itself. They had the forest cover also maintained by the people of that area. They had those crops. The variation on crops was decided accordingly that one was uh, growing something, the other was growing the other. Some areas were growing uh, some vegetables, some were going, growing another type of crop, and they were dependent. Huh? They were dependent upon each other. So they, they were able to survive. They had all those facilities in their village itself, or you can say the town itself also. We had some big cities also of that time, whether it was Ujjain, Hampi, or Indore, but they were completely dependent upon each other and they were surviving. They were able to sustain themselves. They were not over exploiting their natural resources. We do not find anywhere that we had over exploited these natural resources. So where did this natural resource, you know, the over exploitation of natural resource start? And where did, and how did this term of sustainability come? This needs to go back almost like 300 or 400 years back when there was a rush for, uh, you know, in this modern terms, which is called as the industrial revolution. Okay. In that rush, we over-exploited these natural resources, started affecting our health, started affecting our living, started affecting our, you know, the future prospects also. The uh, thing that we are going through right now, this, uh, you know, the pollution we talk about in Delhi or uh, the pollution that we talk about in Mumbai, various type of pollutions. We, uh, we are not having fresh water. We are not having fresh air. We are having chemically infested vegetables and fruits. It was not like this over here in Delhi. This rush started with the industrial revolution. If you see the history, the Europe, the London, and they were highly polluted cities. I'll give you an example through my talk also of one of the cities. But gradually they realized and they took steps. So this is one, uh, one model called as a three-legged stool model for sustainability, which says that there are three parameters when we talk about a city or the sustainable city. Like the first one is the physically built world. That is the economy. Okay. When we talk about the industrial revolution thing, that we require industries, we require wood, we require iron, we require various other natural resources to sustain humanity. That is a physically built world, physically built world. Okay. And 
economy is indeed required when we talk about the finance sector, when we need to talk about the strength. Okay. But then what exactly is this physically built world dependent on? This physically built world is dependent upon the nature, natural world, that is the environment. Even if you are building an industry, you cannot build an industry directly from a plastic. You need resources, you need wood, you need uh, what you call the soil, you need many other things, you need iron, you need metals, you know, you require each and everything from the environment directly or indirectly. If you talk about the ores, the iron ore, okay, you process it, you use it indirectly, but you indeed require. So the physically built world is completely dependent upon the natural world. That is the environment. And these two parameters need to be balanced, need to be sustainable, need to be taken into consideration if we do not want our social world to be affected. Social world consists of various parameters. But over here in our talk, we'll talk about the health services, the, the health parameters. Okay, so when we talk about the social world, this is completely dependent upon the other two factors, that is the physically built world and the natural. So, like when we are talking about the future of the smart cities, I hope the government is indeed taking steps that these cities are able to sustain themselves, not bringing uh, water pipelines from Ganga and giving it to the city. There is more carbon wastage, carbon footprint wastage when we talk about bringing a pipeline from there. Okay, so let's move ahead. As I said, that there is an interrelationship. As the title says, there is an internal relationship between resources and humans. Okay, so there is indeed a connection. As humans, we require there is a connection between protecting the natural environment to safeguard the human health. Okay, in the previous stool model, we found we found that the you know human health is completely dependent upon the environment which we are keeping, and the environment will be dependent upon the natural resources that we are able to sustain. If we are able to sustain a good forest cover for a city. Obviously, the environment will be good. Obviously, the health will be good. If we are able to keep a fresh water resource of a city alive, obviously, we will be able to get good fresh water. We will be able to get good vegetables, clean vegetables, chemical free vegetables. So, the human health is completely dependent upon the natural environment. Okay. And so it should be a very important parameter. Without consuming any of those natural resources, human beings cannot survive. There needs to be an interlinking. And we being uh, what you call a very intelligent race, humans indeed have a great responsibility. Indeed have a great responsibility of you know, utilizing these natural resources in a proper manner and creating a balance in the ecosystem. This balance is indeed being, you know, tinkered with gradually. But this balance needs to be maintained if we want our future generations to survive in a better manner. And also able to use those resources which we have used. So there is an indeed, you know, there is a very important requirement of a link between these availability of the natural resources and the consumption. We are generally talking about human rights, you know, that humans indeed require all these natural resources, but it becomes the responsibility of humans itself to you know, maintain these natural resources also. On the one hand, we need indeed good cities, but on the other hand, we indeed require good cities which have good forest covers also. Right. Well, let me give you a very uh, basic example. Uh, okay. Before we move on to the examples, 
like there is further continuing with this interrelationship. Okay, as I already told you that this all problem started with the industrial revolution. Uh, uh, what you call the environmental parameters which were being affected. Before that, I rarely find uh, what you call uh, humans affecting the environment. Basics, somewhere, uh, somewhere in some places, you might have found that uh, if a new city was established, uh, this uh, environment had changed, but not much. It was localized in some areas or some countries itself, and it was restricted to hardly like uh, an area of 100 kilometers. But now, when we talk about this industrial revolution thing, we find pollution existing in Europe also, we find pollution existing in China also, we find pollution affecting India also, we find pollution in US also. So, overall, the planet is getting affected, and overall, the health. The human life is also affected. Uh, like we used to hear previously that humans used to live for almost 100 plus years, but the average life now has induced to 55. So indeed, these things need to be considered. You know, the, what you call the human economic system. There is one term called as a human economic system. When we talk about the biosphere, biosphere is complete. You know, the environment, the land, the soil, the water, that is all biosphere. But with this advent of industrial revolution, there is one term that has entered called as the human economic system. But indeed, humans require growth. The economies are dependent. The humans have found this system of, you know, developing itself, highlighting itself, getting cars, much better cars and cars and cars, you know, uh, developing those technologies, developing those computers and everything, they are indeed very good. But are we balancing it? And that is an uh, you know important thing that when one on the one hand we are creating that artificial system of things, <clears throat> we need to uh, you know realize and make those link that that artificial system is balanced with the natural system also. <coughs> Like, um, personally, if I have seen that even if you go to the higher areas or higher altitudes of uh, like in the Himalayas also in Himachal or uh, if you go for trekking also in some off beaten areas also, I'm not talking about the regular tourist areas, in the off beaten areas also, you will find that a bottle of a Coke, a plastic bottle of a Coke lying over there. Uh, what you call uh, uncle chips and all those packets also lying over. So this artificial system that the humans have created, we are not disposing it off in a proper manner. And that is why we find that many of these uh, toxic chemicals entering into our system. Most recently, like I think two days back, uh, there was a news article that said that the microplastic particles have been found for the very first time in the human blood. Till that time, we were saying that the plastic, the microparticles were not and has not entered into the human body. But this information, this latest uh, research source shows that uh, the plastic pollution has reached at such an extreme level that it has entered into your bloodstream. And that is in the microplastic level, which was not detectable also. Okay, so these needs to be considered. A balance is required. This interrelationship needs to be required, whether it is through what you call uh, public uh, participation or through government participation, bringing out legisl legislations. Yeah? So that all these pollutions, need, you know, all these toxicities, all this pollution, all these. Uh, biological agents that are affecting the human body, they can be controlled. So humans need as little exposure to these harmful parameters as much as possible. Or else we will gradually down the line of 300 to 400 years, we will indeed get modified. Previously, if you see the historical data, Humans indeed have a good long life. They had a good height. They had, uh, you know, good health. 
but right now we are indeed affected and developing nations are much more affected and uh, why do we find an average uh, age of an indian coming reduced to 55 or 60 it's because we are not getting good health we are not getting good air Uh, this is an example of a city that's called the Chattanooga in Tennessee, USA. During the 1960s, it was the, you know, having the most, it was the highest air polluted city of US. And in fact, this river was just similar to what we find the Yamna presently in state of. But then the government took steps government indeed took steps with participation from its citizens some of the steps mentioned over here like they promoted zero emission industries they replaced their diesel buses they promoted recycling of waste they improved the low income housing societies and there was a riverfront park there was an aquarium you know there were many resources that they created. But that was because the participation of the public and government. And now it's such a beautiful city. Right now, if you talk about India, we are at a developing phase. We are at a growing phase. And um, I, I have complete trust that uh, it won't take more than like 10 to 15 years when our some of our cities will be coming out as clean cities, as self-sustaining cities. Although uh, already we find uh, many cities like, uh, like Indore or Bhopal working on these parameters. They are controlling all these waste materials. They are controlling the pollution level. They are building infrastructure for better things. You know? And they are improving their housing also. 